Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Maggie Atwood, and I'd like to welcome you to today's Chats with Champions. It is entitled, it is entitled Peering into the Deep Extreme Corals. The chat series is sponsored by the first here at 223 Main Street in Damascata, a community bank chartered in the mid-1800s that has grown to serve its customers at 16 branches along the main coast. At this time, I'd like to <clears throat> remind everyone to silence your electronic devices, and also to mention that there's a donation basket on the table, and these donations are very much appreciated. Though 90% of the world's ocean is classified as deep sea, knowledge of what lies at the deepest parts of our planet is still poor at best. Dr. Rian Waller's research seeks to uncover the mysteries of the deep and has taken her from one end of the planet to the other in search of corals living in places you'd never expect. These corals make a living where few can and in turn provide unique and extensive habitats for literally thousands of associated species, making them important biological components of our oceans. This talk will take you through a whirlwind tour of what is known about these corals of the deep and through some of the exotic and less than exotic locations. Dr. Rian Waller is an associate research professor of marine science at the Darling Center. She completed her undergraduate degree at the University of Wales and her PhD at the Southampton Oceanography Center in the UK. From there, she moved over to a postdoctoral fellowship at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute on Cape Cod. And from there, she moved to a faculty position at the University of Hawaii, but spent most of those three years in the Antarctic doing research. Moving to the Darling Marine Center in 2011, Rian's laboratory now thrives with undergraduates and graduate students researching various aspects of cold water coral ecology from all over the planet. Rian was recently voted into the Explorers Club as a fellow, she is a National Geographic Explorer for the Environment, and she was featured this past March in National Geographic Magazine as a risk taker in the age of exploration. When not setting off around the world with 200 pounds of dive gear, Rian lives in Jefferson with her partner Brandon and her faithful Hawaii companion, Barkley the dog. Please welcome Rian Waller. <laughs> so, uh, thank you so much for uh, having me here today. I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk to you in the community. Uh, first off, I'm going to apologize a little bit about my voice. I've been talking to prospective parents and students from the University of Maine for the last few days. Now, after several hundred parents asking me a lot of questions, my voice may go. Uh, so, if I start doing hand signals, you'll know why. Um, so, what I wanted to talk to you today um, is a little bit about the deep ocean and a little about, a bit about some of the research that I do. And a good place that I always think to start this is to take a little look back. Um, or maybe a little large lead back. To look back at the Earth itself. Um, and one of my favorite quotes from Arthur C. Clarke, how is it appropriate to call this planet Earth when it's quite clearly ocean? Over 70% of our planet is actually ocean. And over 90% of that ocean is classified as the deep sea. Now the deep sea is classified as an area of roughly um, 200 meters and down. So where the continental shelf ends, um, out of any of our continents and down is, is deep ocean. So much of what we call our planet Earth is actually deep sea. Now the deep sea is relatively unexplored. Um, we know very, very little about what lives at the bottom of our ocean, about what the habitats are like at the bottom of our ocean. And a quote that we often use is 1% of the deep sea is explored, and we know more about the surface of the moon than the bottom of our oceans. <laughs> And this is very, very true, because if you think about it, you can stick a telescope up and you can look at the surface of the moon. But you try and look at the bottom of the ocean, and you have all this water that's in the way. And so far, there's really no good way to get rid of that water and have a look at what's on the bottom of this ocean. So a good illustration of how little we know um, about the deep ocean is an example just a few years ago. In 2005, the USS San Francisco was a nuclear submarine that uh, smashed right into the side of an uncharted seamount at 200 meters depth. And this was just south of Guam, in one of the most major shipping routes on our planet. And yet the seamount had been completely uncharted, completely unknown, nobody knew it was there. 
and yet this nuclear submarine managed to bash into the side of it. There are several injuries, but thankfully no deaths on this particular accident. Again, we know very, very little about what even the shape of the bottom of our ocean looks like, let alone the animals that actually live there. <clears throat> so what do we know about the deep sea? So what is the deep sea like as an environment? Well, first of all, it's very, very dark. There's no light in our ocean down can cost about 200 meters, and in most of our ocean, really not cost 100 meters. It really depends on how much stuff is in the water, how much sediment is in the water, how far you can see. So in the tropics where it's nice and clear, you can get down to about 200 meters and still have a little bit of light. Um, but places like the Gulf of Maine, you're lucky if you can go 10 meters and still be able to get light. Down in the deep sea, there's very, very high pressure. At 1,000 meters, it's roughly 100 times the, the pressure that you get on the surface. So any animals that live there have to survive this immense pressure bearing down at 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 meters. We also see very, very cold temperatures. Most of the deep ocean lies about 2 to 6 degrees Celsius. But you start going up towards the poles and down into the abyssal plains into the really deepest parts of our oceans, and you're talking just a few degrees, one or two degrees. And if you go to the Antarctic, it actually gets down to minus 1.5 degrees Celsius. It's very, very salty and very, very cold. So the animals that live there have to be very, very special. It's a very special kind of animal to be able to survive all these different conditions in the deep ocean. Now, what I'm really here to talk to you about today is corals. And this is what most people think about when they have someone to come and talk to them about corals. So this is the Great Barrier Reef. They think colorful, warm, tropical waters. Uh, reef fish, sunlight bearing down, maybe a margarita in your hand as you snorkel around. <laughs> this is your typical coral reef. And what I might want to show you today is some coral reefs that I personally believe are much more beautiful, much more interesting, and much more exciting than any of these corals that you can stick on a mosque and fins and go snorkel around. So one of my favorite places, one of my favorite coral reefs on the planet is actually in the North Atlantic. And this is where I did a lot of my PhD work, just off of the north coast of Ireland um, and, and down to the North Atlantic Ocean. So these are some corals, photos that I've taken over the course of my career. Um, I have a very technological stick here. Um, so this is coral reef habitat here. Um, there's hard corals, soft corals, and this was taken about 1,500 meters depth from a submersible. Uh, this one here is taking about 2,000 meters depth off of an ROV, remotely operated vehicle. And this coral here lies at about 4,000 meters depth um, in the North Atlantic Ocean. Now, the North Atlantic actually has more species of coral than you will find on the Great Barrier Reef. It's a very, very speciose area for, for deep sea corals. All lying well below the depth of sunlight, all surviving without sun. Another area that I personally find extremely beautiful corals is Nova Scotia and all the way into the Gulf of Maine. You see some of the most colorful deep water corals in this area. And most of these coral reefs lie at about 1,000 meters or so. Um, but you'll see purples, oranges, yellows, just beautiful, beautiful colors, beautiful uh, forms of, of different coral too. You have hard corals, you have soft corals, you have mushroom corals, and little cup corals, lots and lots of different species. And then one of my personal favorites, the Antarctic. Now, whoever thinks that they would be coral in the Antarctic, not, not many people. But there are actually around 50 different species of coral in the Antarctic that have been known about since the late 1800s. So we've known that there has been coral there for a very, very long time. And in fact, I had two cruises, in, one in 2008, one in 2011, where we actually found 11 new species of coral. So there's a lot to be discovered down in the Antarctic. Very few people go there to look at the corals and to be able to look at the bottom habitat. because It's a very extreme place to live. So these are examples of some of the corals that, uh, that you can collect in the Antarctic. Big cup corals this is actually one of the largest cup corals we find in the world. They actually grow to about this big mm -hmm. on the face, single, single pot. Um, other cup corals, and then reef building corals as well. Um, so corals in the Antarctic, all the way from 50 meters down to over 4,000 meters, you will find corals in the Antarctic. So these are some more pictures of just different species of corals from all over the world. And these are uh, pictures that I've taken over the course of my research. We have black corals, we have reef building corals, we have soft corals, we have beautiful colors. So what are these deep sea corals and how are they different from tropical shallow water corals? So um, these corals in deep water don't photosynthesize. So that's the first thing to note about tropical corals. Tropical corals have this little photosynthetic algae inside their cells and they use the sunlight to be able to produce energy and to be able to survive. Well these kinds of corals don't have that photosynthetic algae. So they can't produce energy from the sun. And that means that they can live anywhere. They don't need warm waters, they don't need light. So they live on the bottom of our oceans and they live in a cold, polar areas. These corals rely entirely on food fall. So 
So if you think of those big phytoplankton blooms that happen in the upper ocean, all that food in the upper ocean, all those animals have to die at some point. And when they die, they float down into the deep ocean. And little bits get picked away as it goes, but a certain amount does re reach the deep sea. And we call that feeding the deep ocean. That's what these corals feed off of. So these corals are found uh, all over the world. They're found in every single ocean. We found them in every single ocean so far. Um, and they can be shallow water, um, you know, 10 meters or so in the polar areas and all the way down to the deepest depths of our ocean. We know corals survive down to 6,000 meters, and I suspect as we start to examine even deeper in the ocean, we will continue to find coral species. One of the more interesting facts about cold water corals is there's actually 3,100 species known to date, actually slightly over that number, known to date of these cold water corals. And that is double the number of shallow water tropical corals that are found below the planet. There are more species of coral living in our deep ocean than there are in the tropical waters that we can snorkel around and see every single day. So if we put the corals on a map and we look at where shallow water corals are, this is really why we call them tropical corals. So they're limited between the tropics. And this is because they need sunlight year round. They can't live in temperate areas where it gets darker over the, the fall. Um, so they, they have sunlight year round, it's relatively warm. They're able to photosynthesize and continue to produce energy. Now, alternatively, if we look at a map of deep water, cold water coral locations, you can see that the corals are found absolutely everywhere. And this is a map made by a colleague of mine at USGS, and it's several years old now. And there's many, many more points that we could stick on this map. But one thing to really note about this is where you see gaps, like here in the Indian Ocean, this isn't because corals aren't there. It's because we don't go there to look for corals. Now, in the course of my career, I've been on about 45 uh, research cruises, and uh, I'd say about three quarters of those were going out looking for cold water corals. But even on the quarter that weren't, we found cold water corals. Even on the cruises where we went to look at hydrothermal vents, we still found corals. Corals are absolutely everywhere in the deep ocean. We just know very, very little um, about, you know, we don't even really know where they are. There's huge gaps in our knowledge, let alone how they live, how they survive, how they thrive in these deep ocean conditions. So why do we know so little about what lives on the bottom of our ocean? Well, I explained we have that water layer that's in the way. Well, there's also a technology issue as well. Um, the ability to go out into these open ocean environments is very, very expensive. First off, you need very large ships. If you go down to the Antarctic, you need icebreakers. If you go out to the middle of the Atlantic, you need a relatively large vessel just to be able to survive the wave heights out there. So when you're talking about some of these research vessels, you're talking about forty-five dollars to $50,000 a day just to get out there. But that only gets you the boat. That doesn't get you the ability to go and see what's in the bottom of the ocean. So we have other tools, like submersibles. This is an Allen submersible out of Woods Hole. Holds three people, one pilot, two scientists. Um, we have remotely operated vehicles. So this is a robot on a tether, where you can go down. The scientists sit on board the ship in a, in a little um, cabin and, uh, and look at the bottom on uh, TV screens. And then we have other vehicles, too, so towed camera systems and then autonomous vehicles that you can program, set off, they'll go run a track and then come back. Now, with each of these vehicles you're talking, you know, on top of your 45,000 a day for the ship, you're talking another 40 to $50,000 a day just to rent any of these systems. So to be able to go out, A, it's very limited, there aren't these resources everywhere, and B, it's extremely expensive to be able to get out there. So another issue with why we know so little is really the weather. A lot of places where these deep sea corals are, you know, they're right in the middle of the North Atlantic. And so you're at, right out in the open ocean. Um, and you're not able to be able to go out there very often. Even when you do go out there, sometimes you get weather like this and you're locked inside for three weeks. So these are all pictures taken off of my cruises. The top one is actually one of my first cruises, and this was a hurricane that came through the North Sea. <laughs> and uh, we had equipment that got loose on the back deck, about 50 kilograms big weighted balls, and they started smashing up equipment. So two guys had to go out on the line to try and catch these rolling <laughs> balls in the middle of the hurricane. Uh, this was another cruise in the North Atlantic and another hurricane. And on the bottom here, this is actually Antarctic. And uh, under here is actually sampling gear. Uh, this is me hanging on for dear life. <laughs> and there are chunks of ice in that water, so it's really kind of cold. <laughs> so this, the weather is really a major issue. Another major issue that we find with the weather, too, is it really messes with your twister game. <laughs> <laughs> when you're locked inside for three weeks in a hurricane, you have to do something. And it's kind of fun to play twister. It adds an extra dimension to it. These are pictures taken at the Drake Passage in the Antarctic when, when we had bad weather. 
So why are these corals important? You know, why do I work on corals? Why do I think everybody should know about these deep sea cold water corals? Well, first off, they grow very, very slowly. Because they can't photosynthesize, they can't produce their own energy, they're entirely reliant on that food fall coming from above. And so they grow very, very slowly. Tropical corals will grow in the region of 5 to 10 centimeters a year. These cold water corals will grow in a few millimeters of a year, usually about 4 or 5 millimeters, depending on species. So they grow very, very slowly, with very, very old organisms. Um, one coral uh, that was collected off the coast of Hawaii was about six feet high, was dated at 4,000 years old. So they could also be some of the <coughs> oldest uh, animals on our planet as well. We just don't know a lot about them right now to be able to say that. They're also very fragile ecosystems as well because they grow so slowly. They're very, very sensitive to disturbance. Any kind of disturbance that goes through will take many hundreds, if not thousands of years to be able to regrow. And the other important thing about these corals is they're really an oasis. If you think of the Great Barrier Reef, you think about the reef fish, you think about starfish, you think about the urchins, you will find all of that in the deep ocean, uh, in my opinion, more as well. Um, one such reef has been found to house over a thousand different species of associated animals. You know, fish go there to, to lay their eggs and protect their young. Uh, juvenile fish go there to eat, to feed off of some of the other organisms. You get crabs, all kinds of different, uh, different animals live around these corals. So now I thought I'd just show you a couple of photos um, that myself and my colleagues have taken over the years. So this is a picture from the Northeast Atlantic. This is about 900 meters of water. And here we have, this is a hard coral structure. So a big, big reef. These are mounds that form about 100 meters high. So a very, very large reef system. This is actually a species of soft coral and a species of black coral. And then this is a basket star, or wilgonocephala. And these guys grow, you know, bigger than your head. They're, they're enormous and just beautiful. They stick their arms up into the current and they'll catch particles and bring them back into the center to feed. Really, really beautiful <coughs> organisms to see. Uh, this is a picture taken off of Norway, a place called the Ross Reef. It's one of the largest reef systems that we've found in the deep ocean so far. It's about 400 meters depth, and this is a pollock. Um, we see a lot of different commercial species live around these cold water corals. A lot of commercial crabs, a lot of commercial fish use these uh, coral reef habitats as areas to raise their young, as areas to go and hide from predators. This picture is taken about 2,000 meters uh, in the middle of the North Atlantic, an area of seamounts, um, probably one of the places, furthest places you can get from land in the North Atlantic. So this is a manipulator arm of a ROV collecting a, a coral sample from the top of this rocky seamount. <coughs> and then this picture here uh, was actually taken in Nova Scotia. <coughs> this is a silastery coral reef. And these types of coral reefs are really common in Alaska. They're really common down in Patagonia and Chile. Um, it's, it's about 500 meters of water. So here is the coral. There's lots of other species that live around too, little redfish as well. Um, very, very speciose areas. Another area I thought you guys might be interested in too is the Gulf of Maine. And this is hot off the press just from a cruise last year. And we have another cruise going out this year to go and look for cold water coral ecosystems right here in our backyard. Uh, believe it or not, this photo was taken last July in the Gulf of Maine. It does get flat out there occasionally <laughs> and sunny. <coughs> and this is a towed camera system. So we used a towed camera system last year, and then this year we'll go back with an ROV to be able to go and collect samples and be able to say exactly what's there. So this uh, towed camera system, we all sit in a little box up on deck um, and look at computer screens all day as the, the camera is underneath. It's actually me here and my colleagues. And, and these are some of the things that we found in the Gulf of Maine. So this is 200 meters. Uh, this is three different species of corals in areas that were just absolutely covered in corals. And inside these corals, we saw starfish, we saw sea urchins, we saw, saw a lot of different species of fish as well. Um, here's another area kind of looking down a cliff. So one of the frustrations with using a towed camera is a towed camera system is just towed behind the ship, whereas an ROV or submersible you can drive up or down. And so we'd see these beautiful lush areas go beneath us, and you can't go up and down and have a look at it. All you can see is the cliff. But we know from scaling lasers that some of these, these corals were over four or five feet high, which puts them about 400, 500 years old uh, by growth rates that we know from other areas. So some really old coral habitats are here in the Gulf of Maine. We're trying to go out next this year, this July, to try and classify those a little bit more and see what's there. So talking about other animals that use these corals as home, we found some really interesting interactions between different species. Now this is a picture taken again from the North Atlantic. Can you tell I love the North Atlantic, my favorite place? Um, this is a coral called bottle brush coral. These are about yay high. Um, you'll be driving around about 2,000 meters and you'll see one or two and sometimes you'll see fields of them. 
And we started noticing that inside these corals, we'd see these little gelatinous mats right here. And we started noticing that on this particular coral, we'd often see this gelatinous mass. We wouldn't see it on any other species of coral, we'd just see it on this one. So we decided to collect a few and have a look and see what we could see. So we brought them up to the surface and we started to carefully dissect them out. And it surprised all of us what popped out. It was a little Dumbo octopus. So um, this is both the same species, this is just an earlier long form of the, the Dumbo octopus. So these are very, very common deep sea octopus. Nothing has ever been known about their life cycle, how they reproduce. Um, and yet we found their eggs amongst some of the corals, and on a very specific species of coral too. And so this is something that researchers are working on to see whether this is a very obligate, very specific relationship between this one species and whether they do grow elsewhere as well. So another very interesting relationship that we saw as well, if you've been wondering where Mr. T is, <coughs> down at about 4,000 meters. <laughs> this is actually a, a bulb head that the um, very last died of an extremely long cruise. We decided to attach it to the top of the ROV, just out of camera range for the pilot. We did it without the pilots knowing. We got down to 4,000 meters and we found this beautiful coral. This is a bamboo coral. Bamboo corals have these little nodes. And this guy is 11, 12 feet high. I mean, it's enormous. It's all wrecked around the top. And so we're like, wow, we should put the camera up there, see if we can see the top of it. And the pilot pulls around and sees it and goes, oh my god, what's that? <laughs> but by the end of the dive, they figured out that if they move the thrusters just right, they can get his head to ball. <laughs> we have all this video of Mr. T bobbling on the <laughs> Another interesting relation, uh, animal that we often find around corals uh, is the very rare deep sea anglicator. <laughs> and this is what happens when you lock scientists inside for 10 days <laughs> over, uh, over Halloween. We didn't have any, um, any uh, pumpkins, we only had potatoes, so we had a scary potato competition. Uh, this was actually on an Alvin cruise where we went out, we only had uh, 12 science days, we got two dives, and then we're locked inside in Hurricane Katrina. <laughs> yeah, we can amuse ourselves. <laughs> so a phrase that I often use as a deep sea biologist, as a particularly deep sea coral biologist, is out of sight, out of mind. You know, you can put on your mask, fins and snorkel, you can snorkel around those shallow water corals, somebody runs an oil tanker over a shallow water coral reef, everybody knows about it. Yet this can happen in the deep ocean and nobody will know about it because you can't see it. It's not, it's not easily visible. And these corals are very, very sensitive to disturbance. And over the, the 10 years that I've been looking at cold water corals, um, pretty much every cruise that I've gone on, we found some kind of human disturbance on the bottom. So I was gonna show you a couple of things that we found uh, just over the last couple of years. So this again is the North Atlantic, there's a theme here. Um, and this is an area called Corner Right Seamounts. And these are seamounts in the North Atlantic that are just off the North Atlantic Ridge on the west side. Um, again, it's one of the most remote places you can go. This is about three, four days out of the Azores and a good week out of Cape Cod to be able to get here. Um, it's a series of, of seamounts, it's five of them. And uh, we went out there to explore, to look at seamounts that hadn't been looked at before. But we knew one of the seamounts in this chain had had an experimental fishery back in the 60s. The Russians had gone out there and ran an experimental fishery for a deep sea fish, particularly Oreo fish. And they ran it for five years just to see whether it was economically viable. And so we wanted to have a look and see what differences we could see. So we went to one side of the seamount that was very rocky, very rough terrain where we knew that it couldn't possibly be fishing. And these are some of the ecosystems that we saw, just beautifully lush corals, lots of fish, lots of other associated species. And then this is what we saw in areas where we saw flat plateaus. Mm -hmm. So we saw lots of broken branches of corals, we saw areas where a gear had obviously impacted the bottom, picking up these, these were all coral reefs, these were actually corals, reef building corals here. It's an ario fish, we did see a lot of ario fish out there. <clears throat> and then this is one edge of the seamount, where the side of the gear has obviously hit the side of the seamount, it's gone up and then there's just nothing up on top, there's nothing left at all. Um, and then other things that we saw, we saw these thin lines, which are probably the weights of crab pots, something like that. Um, so pots that aren't necessarily on the bottom, but their weights are, can go through. Um, this is sponges. And some of these sponge habitats are several hundred years old too, so it'll take a long time for them to regrow. One of the most interesting things that we saw is we really didn't see much in the way of regrowth, and yet this was nearly 50 years later. So it can take a long, long time for these habitats to be able to regrow to their previous state. Now it's not just out in the open waters too, even last summer, in July, this is what we saw in the Gulf of Maine. So this is an old troll net from when they used to do deep sea trolling in the Gulf of Maine. And in the middle here, this is a coral. 
still alive, and then pieces that are dead all around it. We saw several several areas like this in the Gulf of Maine that have obviously been impacted by fishing gear. So deep sea trolling is one of the major threats to these deep sea coral communities. And the main reason is that they do harbor these commercial species. A lot of commercial species of fish and crab do use these coral reef habitats. And so as, as, as shallow water fish are running out, fishermen are having to go deeper and deeper to maintain their caches and maintain their livelihoods. And so we're starting to see this impact between what's on the bottom and the fish. So another impact that we see to, to cold water corals, the oil exploration in particular, so I recognize this is the Gulf of Mexico. So for my postdoc work down in Woods Hole, um, I helped to create a database of cold water coral locations all around the U.S. And this was to be used for management purposes to try and conserve areas of cold water corals. And so we used um, cruise reports. We used cruise reports back to the 1800s. We used taxonomy reports. And in the Gulf of Mexico, this is what we saw. So all these black triangles here are all cold water coral locations. Now the blue little stars here are locations that colleagues of mine down in Florida, um, these are cold water coral reefs that they have been looking at for about five years. They go back every single year to see how the ecosystem is changing, try and classify the ecosystem well, just be able to get back there. And then the green, green little dot here um, is the Deepwater Horizon wellhead. So where it exploded in 2010, it was in 1,500 meters depth of water and uh, released around 700,000 tons of oil. Now, if you go back to the Gulf of Mexico today, they'll say, hey, it's all clean, it's all gone. But if you go down to the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico today, this is the kind of thing that you'll see. So this is very similar to a lot of the species that I've been showing, only it's now covered in this black stuff. Now, a lot of the data from this area is embargoed, so I can't tell you that's oil. I can tell you it looks like oil, and I can tell you that a lot of the corals down there look exactly like this. So these are areas, again, that the folks in Florida have been studying for many, many years, and now this whole ecosystem is gone. So oil exploration, mineral exploration happening now in deeper and deeper waters. So again, we're starting to see that conflict between what's on the bottom, the habitat forming organisms, and, and how we need to use our oceans. <coughs> so what do I work on? What is my research area? Well, as Maggie kind of said, you know, to work in the deep ocean, you have to be an explorer. You have to be able to go out and seek and find where things are, get the training to be able to do that. Because we just don't know enough about where these organisms are, let alone start to be able to look at their ecology. Um, but in my heart, I'm a reproductive biologist. I like to look at how animals reproduce and survive, how these populations have persisted over many thousands of years, and how they go between different oceans. There are certain species of cold water corals that have been found in every single ocean. But how do they do that? Those are the kind of questions that I want to know. Um, and I also want to know how um, different impacts in the ocean are affecting these reproductive processes too. So fishing damage, how does that, that, uh, uh, how does that affect the cold water corals? Does it stop them reproducing? Can they stop producing larvae? Um, how is climate change going to affect how these corals are reproducing? Um, so these are a couple of species that I work on. So this is this Antarctic species. And this little guy here is a two-week-old larvae. Um, and we call this stage the bunt cake stage. It's a bit like a bunt cake underneath the little pencils. Very, very cute. So these are from the Antarctic, and these are from some work in Alaska. So my lab primarily uses histology. So this is um, making thin sections of pieces of corals um, down to a couple of microns. So this is a thin section of a female. So here are eggs, a couple of different sizes. Um, and we'll count the eggs, we'll measure the eggs, and then we can have a look and see you know, how these animals are reproducing. And then these are eggs. And these are what we call spermatocysts, so these are balls of sperm, the corals are released into the water column and they'll break up over time and be able to fertilize the eggs. And these are from an experiment where we were making larvae out of Alaskan corals. So one of the major issues that I come across in my research is that ability to get into the deep ocean. You know, we're finding, as we, as we look at the reproduction of more and more species that, that live in the deep ocean, we're realizing that they don't all reproduce all the time, which was the common thought. Well, it's all the same in, in the deep ocean. Temperature doesn't change, there's no seasons, so of course the animals can be reproducing. But that's not really true. A lot of the animals we're finding do reproduce, reproduce on a seasonal scale. They reproduce just once or twice a year. And very often that's fitted in with the food fault. So when that food dies in the upper ocean and falls down, it kind of creates a season. And so they'll use that to be able to reproduce. <coughs> and so the problem comes, that, you know, if you walk, work in the North Atlantic, like I did in my PhD, and I found a species where I had enough samples around, that you know, I just wasn't getting any that were actually actively reproducing. And I hypothesized that they were probably reproducing in January. But nobody was willing to take me into the North Atlantic in January. <laughs> and I tried really, really hard. But nobody, nobody would take me. Um, 
and so I still don't know if that species that I worked on for you know three years of my life actually reproduces in January or not. We just we have samples from the spring, we have samples from the fall, but we we'll never get that those samples. And so a lot of my job is really taking puzzle pieces and trying to put them together. So I will go out and collect samples from museums that have been collected, you know, back in the 1800s. I will collect samples myself out on cruises, roughly the same area. I'll get that data, I'll try and put it together and try and make a hypothesis about what these species are doing. One of my bigger claims to fame is in my PhD thesis, I actually have a sample from a coral that was collected on the day that I was born <laughs> and used that in, for, for, my, uh, for my work. So, so well, it's very, very frustrating as a deep sea biologist. You know, you start to see this little pattern, but you can't actually classify it really, really well. We work with what we have, we get a lot of good data, but we really need more. And so I was very excited when, about five, ten years ago, this uh, phenomenon called deep water emergence was discovered. So we've known for a long time that as you get up towards the poles, a lot of these cold water species will start com coming shallower, because the shallower water is colder, it's darker for much of the year, and there isn't much in the way of competition like there is in tropical areas. But what we did know is that a lot of the species in the poles were different from those in the deep ocean. Well, a few years ago it was discovered that actual deep sea species can come up living, living shallower in very special areas of the globe. And this was usually in shore, glacial fjord areas. And this was something that was discovered in Norway, Sweden, and down in New Zealand. And then about five years ago, a colleague of mine discovered the same thing in Alaska, um, in the fjords within the Inside Passage. And he discovered that there were cold water corals. This is a red tree coral. And this is a species that's usually found in about 500 meters of water um, out in the Gulf of Alaska. It goes from about 500 to 1,000 meters in its usual, <coughs> usual uh, um, range. And they were out there, it was a NOAA group, they were out there um, mapping crab populations. And they turned a corner and came across this beautiful deep sea coral with a big crab set on. And he was like, well, I kind of recognize that because I've been out on deep sea coral cruises. That shouldn't be here. And uh, took pieces, we got it identified, and indeed, it is exactly the same species as we find out in the deep ocean. So suddenly we have this opportunity um, to use this area as a living laboratory. So just like the deep ocean has deep sea species, it's in an area in an enclosed fjord where I can sample 12 months of the year. So we can really start to look at seasonal patterns, at seasonal ecology of a deep sea species. So in 2011, we started um, a, a long-term uh, area um, in a place called Tracy on Fjord. And if you've ever gone cruising around Alaska, um, this is one of the popular stops. It's a big glacier at the end, um, very, very popular with tourist boats. And this is an area called, uh, we call it Big Bend. Um, out Fjord is this way, and going in towards the glacier is this way. There's actually three glaciers, glacier heads that, that dump out into this fjord. Um, the mountain is about 2,000 meters high. Um, and it drops down about 500 meters down in the deep fjord. And the reason that this is a great area for deep sea animals to, to come in is the water is cold year round because of the glacier. Um, there's very, very little competition. You just don't get a lot of the algae, which is usually what's competing for space with these corals. And at the end of this fjord, there's a very, very high sill. The sill actually comes up to about 10 meters. So you get super fast water running through there. And these corals love fast water. Um, so this is a great area. So we went and we dove all over this area and tried to find um, try, try to find different areas of corals where we could do a, a, a study site. Um, so we put in a proposal um, to try and um, set up tags. We wanted to go out and tag different, different colonies and be able to go back again and again. Now the one problem I had in this is I hadn't learned to dive. I worked entirely in the deep ocean. Um, I was a poor graduate student and then postdoc. I never had the money to be able to dive. And so I, I never actually learned to do it. So we put in this proposal. Um, to, to try and set up an area where I could sample corals 12 months of the year uh, in Alaska. The day I got funded, I actually signed up for a diving class. Because <laughs> I knew that I was going to be completely unable to stand on the boat while my colleagues were diving and going around this empty system. So I did my open water certification in a week. Uh, two weeks later, I did my advanced certification. Uh, I got a dry suit. Um, I came to, a, to a Maine. I actually moved to Maine in January. Uh, I did my science diver qualification in January 2011, which if any of you remember was a massive snow year. So we were digging out the dock before we went diving. Uh, the water was, you know, it was 33, 34. It was really cold. Um, and so I flew off to Alaska in March 2011, um, sorry, March 2012, uh, no, March 2011, to, uh, to start this project, to go down and look at these corals. To give you a little bit more perspective too, so this is looking at the side of that mountain as, as we go. And uh, just for some extra perspective here, this is me. These are my fins. 
and this is my head here. So, very, very steep topography. Um, and if any of you have, have read the National Geographical the Geographic article that came out last March, this is the area where that particular incident happened. Um, so I, I got pulled up last year by National Geographic, sorry, the year before by National Geographic saying I've been selected for a risk takers article. They wanted to feature one scientist explorer every single month and they said they wanted to do me. Did I have a good story I could tell? <laughs> so it happened that at that point I did have a really good story that I could tell. Um, so I've been diving in this location a couple of times, but you know, compared to, to many divers, especially around here, I'm still a novice. You know, I, I still only have 100 dives on my, on my docket. Um, a lot of those are in cold water, um, very, very fast-moving water, so I, I feel like I'm pretty experienced. Um, we went there in March, we set up the sample area, we tagged 40 different colonies, we were going back every three months to go and get samples, and it got to September in 2012. And uh, that particular September was very, very warm, which meant the glacier was melting at a, quite an extreme rate. When those glaciers <coughs> melt, they let off a lot of silt into the area. Um, and so on the very first day, um, there were three divers on that trip. The three of us decided, you know, we got there early and there was a lot of light late at that time of year, so we decided to gain this extra dive. The three of us would jump in, we'd just get our equipment squared away, we'd, you know, have a look at the corals, make sure we knew where we were, get our bearings. Um, all the rest of it. So the three of us got, got changed and we started to go in the water. We knew it wasn't, the visibility was not going to be great because September is never good. And so we went on holding each other's tanks as we went down. So one guy in front, one person in the middle, I was at the end. And the idea was you just hold on to the person in front of you and look at the wall. You know, don't, don't lose that wall, <laughs> whatever you do. And so we started going down and, and yeah, it's a real mess. You know, the girl in front of me has a bright fluorescent yellow tank so I could see, you know, the outline. I couldn't really see her, I could see the tank. And then we hit about 15 feet and suddenly I can't even see my elbow. You know, I can't see the tank in front of me. And, uh, and so I swap hands because my computer's on this wrist and I'm trying to look at it and I have a headlamp on and the silt is stopping me being able to see my watch. And suddenly I get this thumb right pressed up against my mouse. This is the sign to go up. So the girl in front of me is like, it's time to go. So we started coming up, got to about 15 feet again so I could kind of see her, got to the top and we lost the guy in front. She'd let go to look at her wrist and mm. suddenly it all went and we got back up. And it was just a horrendous trip that way. It was very, very bad visibility. And so we decided from then on, you know, two of us in different pairs would go in, you know, every couple of hours and just see whether this silk layer had, had moved. Our corals lay at 40 feet, so 15 feet wasn't going to cut it. And so we went in day after day and got to about day two and we still hadn't got a single sample. It was still like a six day cruise, so we were starting to get desperate at this point. And so myself and a colleague jumped in, and at this point, you know, we were hoping to sample, so we had a lot of sampling gear with us as well. And uh, so we went in and I was holding on to his tank, and we'd kind of given up on the thought of me even seeing the wall. So I wasn't going to see the wall, I was just going to see the back of his tank. And we had signals worked out, and we saw a car and give me a signal. And it was pouring with rain, it was such a nasty day, it was horrible. And so we jumped in, we get down, but the rain had actually stirred up a lot of the, the silt, and so we could see better. I mean, I could still only see his outline, but we could see better. And so we drop down, we get down to about 40 feet, and start getting excited, okay, this is the deepest we've been in two days. And he gives me the signal, signal that he's found one of our corals. And so, you know, I sidle up to the wall so I can see the wall, I let go, and I drop my head down, I grab my bag, and I start to open up, dig in, grab a bag, and look back, and there's nothing there. I can't see anybody, I can't see him, I can't see the wall. And so I knew the wall was right there, so I started swimming. <coughs> couldn't see it, couldn't see it, kept swimming, couldn't see it. No idea where I was, and my ears started popping. Mm -hmm. When your ears start popping, it means you're going deeper and deeper and deeper. <laughs> so at that point, you know, I restashed the, the bag, put it back onto my jacket, and have a look at my wrist. I started at 40 feet, I was down at 95 feet. Oh. <laughs> so what had happened is the current here, particularly in September, rips through at about two knots. And where you get close to the wall, you have this little buffer. So this is a little area where there isn't much of a current. If you get away from that wall, you can get whipped out really, really fast. And so I had to start swimming up. And as I was swimming up, I was just going deeper and deeper. The current was much faster than me being able to swim. So I ended up having to put air in my jacket, which is something you should never, ever do as a diver to help you go up. And I started to come up slowly um, and, and just managed to control my ascent, get to the surface, and, and found that we had a fantastic support boat. They'd seen my bubbles moving away from the wall into the center of the fjord, and they picked me up in the middle and said, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, sure. <laughs> and by that point, my buddy had surfaced at the wall because he knew I was missing. You know, he hadn't been given his jar. He was getting really pissed because nobody gave him the jar of sample. <laughs> this is the first sample we'd seen all cruise so far. And so he gets up, he's like, where the hell are you? <laughs> so, so 
necessarily brought me back off of the wall. We go diving, we collect samples, and then we get back on the boat. <laughs> so the story that could have gone south very, very quickly, but uh, I put it down to my fantastic training here at the Gulf of Maine um, to be able to, to get through that. And then what people ask me after all of that, um, is it worth it? And so this is the kind of thing that you will see underwater in this fjord area. So these are red tree corals. These little tags, these are our tags, these little fluorescent markers. And this, this could be the deep ocean. I mean, this, this is the kind of thing that I've seen through six inches of plexiglass in a submersible or on a screen or an ROV. And here, I can go up, I can stick my head in it, and I can poke it, I can look at it. You know, it, it was just, seeing these corals for the first time, which was in, in that March of that year, it was just one of the most amazing experiences in my life, and, and still is. You know, being able to see these deep sea ecosystems, be able to swim through them, and just being able to get your head really close to it and be able to see it when it's alive and open, not when it's collected on the boat. We were able to discover a lot more things. We actually discovered a brand new reproductive system in this coral that had never been seen before. The paper's being published actually in a couple of weeks. Um, we saw new relationships of these small little larvae that live around the corals, small fish larvae that we never knew were there. And by the time we collected it and put it on the boat, they're not there anymore, so you'd never see them. So these ecosystems are really, really important. So the next step from this, this study actually ended um, this in March. Some colleagues of mine went out and got samples again, and now that's the end of our funding. We can't go back there anymore. But this, uh, this summer, colleagues will be going out into the outer Gulf of Maine, to the deep waters. And so they'll collect samples from the deep waters. We'll compare them to what we found here in the shallow water over the 12 months of the year, and hopefully be able to say a lot about what is happening in the ocean. So well, well worth it. So something people often ask me too is so being a deep sea biologist. You know, I, I now go to deep sea conferences and I talk about scuba diving for these deep sea um, the corals. The things that I've learned, um, the differences between being a deep sea biologist and a shallow water biologist, um, very often it, the visibility is extremely low. So this is a picture uh, taken actually from Patagonia, Chile. So Patagonia, Chile is another one of these areas in the world where deep sea corals come up shallow. So another area that I've been working. This is actually a picture of two of us in case you haven't noticed. So this is one person, this is my dive buddy, here's his hands, and these are my hands here, and this is my headlamp looking down. We're trying to attach, this is a, a data logger, we're trying to attach a data logger to the bottom. Very, very murky, something you would never see in the deep ocean. You go down to 500 meters and there's just nothing down there, there's no silt, it's just beautifully clear. So I didn't really realize how bad conditions could be underwater until I started diving. And then the other thing that I've learned is it's also really ass cold. <laughs> It's, you get, I mean, you get cold in a submersible. You go down to 4,000 meters in a submersible, and it's ambient temperature. But you get a nice little blanket, and you have your hoodie, and you get the tuck up, and you got your wool cap and your socks, and it's nice and toasty. Well, when you're actually getting into the water, this is actually Alaska in March. Um, the icebergs coming through. Um, it's, it's very cold, and so diving, you know, in a submersible, and you get eight hours, and so you usually get about six hours on the bottom. You're talking 40 minutes, so you have to work really fast. Cold and very, very little visibility. So stepping back again, looking back at the NASA Blue Marble, um, what is next on my cards? Well, I have projects, you know, we're still hoping to continue work in Alaska. We still want to continue trying to get funding for that work. Uh, I have funding to work down in Patagonia and Chile to look at these fjord ecosystems. And I still have projects um, elsewhere in the world, too. There's some projects starting off the Pacific, hoping to get up to Greenland to look at some of the fjord areas there at some point, too. But again, you know, there's 70% of the ocean out there, and 90% of that, this is what I work in, so it's a big way I want to work in. Um, And I look forward to discovering more uh, about what lives in our deep ocean. So just before I show my last slide, um, I just want to introduce those who don't know the Darling Green Center, so this is where my main lab is. So I'm an associate research professor for the University of Maine, but I'm housed, luckily, down here, not in Argo. Um, so we're out in the Pemiquid, Pemiquid Peninsula, we are the Marine Lab of the University of Maine. Most of our faculty are School of Marine Sciences, but we do have a couple of history faculty as well with us. Um, we have facilities, um, this time of year it's very quiet, but in a couple of weeks we'll suddenly have about 200 students to send on us to take classes and internships through the summer. And then the fall semester we actually have about 20 students who come and live with us for the entire semester and do field work every single day, which includes the diving class where we take them diving and they get credit for it. Um, so I'd like to invite you all to come down to the Darling Marine Center to see what's there. This summer we're running tours every single week, um, probably on a Wednesday. The schedule hasn't quite been set, but check out our webpage. Um, we'd love to see you all there and come and get a tour of the different labs and facilities that we have. So my final slide, and uh, this is the slide that I, I like to connect things together. 
So this is a, is a photo taken in North Atlantic at about 3,000 meters depth. And so this is a, a rocky terrain, a very volcanic seamount. Um, and in the middle here we have a coral. And we could see from a distance, this is taken with an ROV, we could see from a distance there was something wrapped around that coral. Does anyone know, can you take a guess of what that might be? Plastic bag. Plastic bag. Plastic bag's pretty close. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what we thought it was as well when we started. And so we kind of sidled right up to it and zoomed in. And uh, we actually found it's one of those mylar balloons. <laughs> this is actually now, because of this photo, which was taken back in 2005, one of my pet hates. So it's, it's one of these silver balloons where all the silver has rubbed off and you can still see the string. You know, this is at 3,000 meters in one of the most remote places you can get to in the Atlantic. And this is my illustration of how we're all connected together on this planet. What we do up on the surface affects the deep ocean. The deep ocean looks after those animals that we use for food. So everything on this planet is connected. We have to look after it, and we have to consider what's in the deep ocean. So with that, I'd like to say thank you very much again for having me here.